we saw this glow of light, just this kind of a halo of a light, just kind of beaming out. He wanted to tell me about a crash of some sort of craft that had occurred on his ranch. He would wad it up in his hand. When it hit the table, it spread out just like water with no wrinkles. And it looked like there's a hieroglyphic type writing written along the inside surface of the uh, I beam. They had no ear lobes, they had two ear canals, two very small orifices for the nose, a concave face. Oh, yes, it was a cover up from the beginning. Roswell, New Mexico, 1947, a military town and air force base, home to America's 509 Bomb Group, a tight-knit community of soldiers and civilians in the heartland of rural America. In the summer of 1947, the whole of America was gripped by a wave of sightings of flying saucers. In Roswell, there were many witnesses to a strange light in the sky. But it was uh, just going in a northerly motion at a pretty rapid speed, but nothing like a falling star or, or a meteorite. So bright like that, you couldn't look direct at it very long at a time. Then you had to look to the side of it, just like looking into a bright sun. William Woody is 61, a pig farmer who worked for the local bus company in Roswell. He remembers to this day what he saw on the night of the 4th of July, 1947. I was 13 years alive, and that was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. We got in the old truck one morning and headed north out 285 just to see if we could locate it. Every exit or path off of the highway was blocked off with the military sentries and said that it was under investigation and nobody was allowed to go either east or west off of the highway. On the Foster Ranch, 75 miles northwest of Roswell, Mac Brazel, a farmhand, was on his daily rounds when he came across some strange material scattered in the fields. His sheep refused to go near it. Unable to identify what it was, Brazel traveled 20 miles to show his nearest neighbor what he had found. Loretta Proctor is 83 and still lives on the same ranch near Corona, north of Roswell. She remembers Brazel arriving on horseback with a collection of strange material. He showed us this piece that looked like plastic or wood of some kind, and he said that there was some metallic-looking stuff that when you crushed it, it just straightened right back out. It wouldn't, you know, wouldn't stay crushed. And there was uh, some beams or something that he said had kind of pinkish purple printing on it. Well, we told him it's probably a UFO and he should report it. <laughs> Brazel took her advice and traveled into Roswell town with the strange debris. He reported his find to the sheriff of Chavez County. Sheriff George Wilcox immediately notified the local air base. Roswell Army Airfield was home to the 509, America's elite bomb group, which had dropped the atomic bomb on Japan. As the only atomic bomb squadron in the world, it was surrounded by the highest levels of security and secrecy. The 509's air intelligence officer was Major Jesse Marcel. 
he was assigned to investigate the material that the rancher had brought in. Marcel drove out to Brazel's ranch to collect some of the debris. That night, he brought it back to his house to show his wife and son. He came back real late one night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, as I recall, very excited because he woke myself my mother up saying they found parts of a UFO or a flying saucer at that time. And uh, he wanted me to see it because it was such of an unusual uh, type of uh, finding. Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr. is himself a pilot, colonel, and state surgeon in Montana's Air Force Reserve. In 1947, he was 12 years old, but he vividly remembers the extraordinary nature of the material he saw that night in Roswell. As I recall, the most unusual part of the debris that I saw was the I-beam fragments, or what I recall as being I-beam, because they were uh, very light, very strong, and they had some writing along the inside surface of this, and that was the thing that really set this apart from anything I'd ever seen before. Dan Dwyer and his colleagues in the Roswell Fire Brigade were also involved. The firemen were shown some remarkable material with curious properties. Dwyer's daughter Frankie was in the station at the time and remembers picking it up. When I would wad it up, it was like I had nothing in my hand. I couldn't feel it touching my skin. It was real weird. You'd drop it on the table and it was just like water, the way it would spread out. Meanwhile, Major Marcel brought the material he'd recovered back to Roswell Army Airfield. The commanding officer, Colonel Butch Blanchard, surprisingly ordered his public information officer, First Lieutenant Walter Hort, to issue an astonishing statement to the press. I was instructed by Colonel Blanchard to put out a press release, which in effect stated that we had in our possession a flying saucer. In essence, it said that we have in our possession a flying disc. It uh, was picked up on a ranch, and I can't remember if I said northwest of Roswell, brought into town by Mac Brazel, a ranch foreman, uh, and the material was flown to higher headquarters, 8th Air Force, General Ramey. It was an announcement that stunned the world. The London Daily Telegraph reported that although no details were given of the craft, the Air Force claimed that it was of a flimsy construction, like a box kite. A small town in America had become the centre of the world's attention. There was a tremendous amount of excitement because as I, here I am, a little country editor in a small city in New Mexico, talking to Paris and Rome and, and London and Tokyo, and I can't remember all of them, spent the whole afternoon on the phone. And I know that my counterparts at the, at the Roswell, other Roswell paper and probably at the radio stations did the same. But there was a lot of excitement. America was transfixed. Radio networks issued hourly bulletins. This is an actual broadcast of the time. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Russia has demanded UN action to get all... Major Marcel had flown samples of the material to Fort Worth, Texas, headquarters of the 8th Air Force. Here, the story would take a remarkable turn. General Roger Ramey, the commanding officer there, called a press conference in his office. In front of photographers, he invited Major Marcel to display the material he had brought from Roswell. The base duty weather officer was also ordered to attend so that he could give his verdict to the press as to precisely what Marcel was holding in his hands. The general called and said, get your ass over here to my office. we got something here we want you to look at. And I, aye, sir. And he says, if you've got a car, fine. If you haven't, get one. Get the first means of transportation and get over to my office. And when I saw that, I said, is that your flying saucer? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, hell no, that's a Raywin target and balloon. And if it isn't, I said, I'd eat it without salt or pepper. I know what that is. Are you sure? 
Yes, I'm sure. I know what that is. This is what I would like to uh, show you. In here, this is the uh, photograph of the debris that was seen in General Ramey's office at Carswell Air Force Base in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. This is my father holding up uh, what is very obviously parts of a uh, radar target with uh, balloon debris. In here, you see both wood fragments. You have actually parts of the balloon envelope in of itself, and uh, you have what looks like paperback metal foil. And to emphasize this, this is not what was seen on the floor of our kitchen that evening or that late uh, early morning hours in 1947. This is totally different. The implication is that Major Marcel may have been ordered to take part in a cover-up that involved switching the material from Roswell for a common weather balloon. General Ramey and the Air Force now discounted their earlier press announcements that they had found a flying saucer. The story was officially dead. But back in Roswell, those who had reported the original story found that the military were behaving somewhat strangely over what they now claimed was merely a weather balloon. Frank Joyce had been the first to announce the original news of the flying saucer at local radio station KGFL just a few hours earlier. I got a phone call. Well, I got a number of phone calls, but the one that really got my attention was purportedly from the Pentagon. There was a young lady on the line saying, Colonel so-and-so, uh, this is the Pentagon calling. And this was within a few minutes of it going out on the wire. And the voice on the line says, uh, who is this? I tell him. He said, you put that story on, on the air about the flying saucers? And I mean, his voice was, you know, the type that really conveys menace and power. And I said, yes, I did. And he says, you're going to get in a lot of trouble uh, for this or made some, some threatening comment. And I said, look, I'm a civilian. You can't talk to me this way. You can't treat me this way. You can't tell me what to do in stories I put on the air. <clears throat> and he says, I'll show you what I can do. And bang, hung up the phone. And the voice at the other end of the line showed exactly the power that he had to the owner of the radio station. I got a call from Washington from one of the offices of one of the senators saying, look, if you put out any stories on this, this thing, you're going to lose your license. And it's not going to be over a period of time. It's going to be the same day that we tell you that you're off the air. Frankie Rowe, the fireman's daughter who had handled some material, had always regarded the Air Force in Roswell as friends of the town. But an unexpected visit from the military to her home would now cast the Air Force in a sinister new light. He had this club or stick or whatever it was and he would, was beating it on his hand and he would hit it. Every time he would say something he'd hit his hand. And he said, I want you to know you were never there. And I didn't understand what he meant because I said, yes I was. And he said, no you weren't. I said, yes I was. And he said, can't you get this through your head? You never saw anything. You were not there. You don't know anything. And he said, you know, this is a big desert out here. We can just take you out in the middle of this desert and no one will ever find your bodies. He said, you'll be nothing but bones and nobody will ever know what happened to you. And I told him I would not talk about it. If it were not for the threats, the entire Roswell affair could be viewed as nothing more than an embarrassing mistake. But in 1965, Butch Blanchard, now a four-star general, attended a reunion dinner in Roswell, and the incident had not been forgotten. Uh, he had been the commander here in 1947, and uh, I was at a table with uh, the general and several other locals when they were interrogating him about the 1947 incident. And uh, he declined to, to answer uh, any of the questions, except he did comment that it was the damnedest thing he'd ever seen. He never would discuss it, but several several months later, one night, uh, I badgered him again, as I like to do, and he said, well, and then he paused. He said, I'll tell you this, and I'm paraphrasing him because I don't remember exactly how he said it, but in essence, he said, 
Uh, what I saw, I've never seen before. For 30 years, the Roswell incident remained a dark secret. Town and military maintained an uneasy silence. The story didn't see the light of day until 1978, when Jesse Marcel, the 509's intelligence officer, went public with an appearance on American television. I was amazed at what I saw. The amount of debris that was scattered over such an area. It took me a while to realize that there's something strange about it, but uh, the more I saw the fragments, the more I realized that uh, it wasn't anything that I was acquainted with. I proved I tried to burn it, it wouldn't burn. I, I, I tried to break it, it would not break. If it was something of ours, uh, there would, I'm sure there would be no reason to keep it under cover that long. If it's an alien spacecraft, there's another reason why it would not have ever been owned by anybody here un until they found out more about it. I sensed that it was, there was a cover-up someplace about this whole matter. In 1947, General Ramey's chief of staff was Colonel Thomas DuBose. Shortly before he died, he was interviewed on home video. As a retired brigadier general, he is the highest-ranking officer ever to comment on the Roswell incident. It was a cover story. The balloon part of it is the story that's to be given to the press, and that is it, and, and anything else, forget it. And McMullen, if you ever knew him, he, if you told him that he wanted to run something, he goddamn sure ran it. He, he knew every facet of the operation. He's a busybody. He, he, wanted to, he wanted to know what the hell was going on, who was pissing on the sidewalk, and all that sort of thing. General McMullen, the deputy head of Strategic Air Command at the Pentagon, was in charge of the entire operation, according to General DuBose. McMullen told me, you are not to discuss this, and this is a point of which this is more than top secret, as he said. It, beyond that, it's within the, my priority as deputy to, to George Kenney and he, in turn, responsible to the president, this is the highest priority you can exist, and you will say nothing, and that's the end of it. And, and Jesus, that's in the commander-in-chief, and, uh, and, you did, and you forgot about it. The revelations of DuBose suggested the American Air Force did indeed have something important to hide. Well, there's no question about that. General DuBose said that specifically to us, that the, the balloon explanation that the Air Force offered was a cover story do you get the reporters off General Ramey's back? So we have a wide body of testimony that was a cover-up. We have military witnesses saying they were sworn to secrecy. We have radio employees telling us that they uh, were told if they broadcast their interview with Mac Brazel, they better look for a new job because they'd be out of the radio business the next day. We can show that beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's no question there was a cover-up. The question is, what were they hiding? What could the Air Force have been hiding for the last 40 years? One man who may hold the key to the Roswell mystery is Frank Kaufman. Kaufman claims that in 1947 he was a Master Sergeant in personnel at Roswell Army Airfield. But what was not known at the time, he says, is that he was also a covert member of a highly secret counterintelligence unit codenamed the Nine. Tonight, Kaufman reveals for the first time what he claims is the true story of the Roswell incident. I was assigned to Roswell in 1942. My duties at that time was somewhat classified the events that led up to the 1947 incident is rather peculiar because there is a lot of erratic movement on the radar screen and this called our attention that maybe we better monitor those screens. They, they sent some of us to Almogordo, to White Sands, to view the 
the blips on the screens. The blips were just dancing from one end of the screen to the other, and then all of a sudden there was kind of a white, a flash, and it just disappeared. Well, that indicated that possibly maybe a plane or a missile or something just went down. Kaufman says he and his team immediately drove east from Alamogordo back to Roswell, then towards a location about 45 miles south of the Foster Ranch. And now this was late at night. We started to clip some of the wire fence and drove into the area. The terrain was very rough at the time. There was no roads leading into it. We saw this, this glow of light, just this kind of a halo of a light, just kind of beaming out. We got to, I guess, maybe about maybe two, maybe 200 yards, maybe 300 yards from where it was. And we learned right then and there, it wasn't a plane, it wasn't a missile, it was kind of a strange looking craft that was embedded in the Arroyo, see. The size of the craft, I would say possibly maybe around 20, 25 feet in length, and, and it was open and kind of halfway, and one, one body was thrown up against the wall of the Arroyo, the other one was, uh, was half in and half out of the craft. And when we got in close, we noticed that there were probably three others inside the craft. Then we radioed in back to the base to have a truck, a flatbed, and a crane, and everything else just come out to the site. And, and we prepared everything to clear everything off. Frank Kaufman provided us with what he claims is a copy of his official report on the Roswell incident a top-secret document containing observations and sketches of what he saw at the time. We saw panels of controls. We, 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 couldn't, we, didn't make, we couldn't make them out. They were, they were uh, uh, writings. We, we didn't know what it... Uh, uh, we couldn't decipher it or anything of that nature. And the underbelly of the craft had a series of cells, you know, ports type cells, so the glass looking cell, octagon shape. This is the actual site where Kaufman says he saw the strange craft for the first time. This is an artist's impression of the aliens based on Kaufman's own descriptions. We noticed one thing that deterioration was beginning to set in and on one of the one of the bodies of the hands, we noticed the hands of skin trying to shrivel up, and that's the reason why we put them in the bags real in a hurry, and got them out to the base hospital. They called the mortuary here to find out if there was anything that they could preserve the bodies with. The base also inquired about the availability of child-sized coffins, and later there was another call to the town undertaker. And I received a call later from the same mortuary officer stating that uh, what them bombing fluids contain consisted of <clears throat> what would it do to the blood contents, what would it do to tissue, stomach contents, and how would it alter it. And I informed him what, I, what the answers that he wanted. Glenn Dennis also had the ambulance contract to ferry any injured servicemen to the base. That same day, he took an airman to the hospital and was amazed to find himself being roughly escorted off the base by military policemen who told him he had no right to be there. As they were taking me out, there was a door that was open over to the left and there was a nurse coming out that had a towel over a portion of her face and uh, she looked up and she recognized me and she said, Glenn, get out of here. Get out of here as fast as you can, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Then the next morning she called me about 10 o'clock or so and said that she would like to see me, that she we had to talk. And so I met her out at the officers club that morning. And uh, she was already there when I arrived at the officers club. Uh, 
she was very upset, still crying, very hysterical. Then she told me what happened about going into this room. These doctors were there and there was some uh, two hospital gurneys there with the crash bags. One crash bag was two very small mutilated bodies. The other one, there was a very small body in a crash bag but hadn't been mutilated as much as the others. And she told me the reason what they wouldn't let her out because uh, they wanted her to write down what they were examining. And that's what she was doing. And they all became very ill. They said that the smell, and it was a very toxic smell, and they just couldn't breathe and get their breath, and they had to get out. This is Hangar 84. And uh, this is where the uh, craft and the bodies were actually brought into this hangar. But uh, there was a lot of activity in this area here. Inside the hangar, right above on top, there was this large spotlight which was shining down on the craft and also the bodies were laid out, there were five of them. And there was a cordon of, of uh, military police around the area to keep people getting too close. There were other witnesses to the strange events at Hangar 84. I had security clearance. So I told him I was, came over there to pick up uh, Lieutenant Governor Joe Montoya. He was at the hangar. Joe Montoya, Lieutenant Governor of New Mexico, was at the base campaigning for re-election. Outside Hangar 84, Reuben and Naya was waiting to pick him up. So the, so the AP just lead us over there, you know, and then, but they didn't let us, they didn't park close to the hangar. They park about a half a block away. And I said, what the hell's going on, you know? And then, and then, and then, uh, well, when, when they went tower, the, I moved a little closer. And that's when uh, the big hangar was open. And uh, Senator Montoya came out. He says, he says, let's get the hell out of here. He says. Well, he was, he come out of there, he come all scared. And he said, he had, he said, they saw two little men with the big heads. But one was alive, still alive. They had him laying down on the, on the, on the floor. And he come out and told us. The boss was there, and one was still alive. There were other witnesses with strange reports of aliens. Fireman Dan Dwyer told his daughter Frankie what he had seen. He said it did not come from this world. It did not look like anything he had ever seen. And he said there were little people out there. And mother asked him what he meant by little people, and he said... They weren't human people, but they were little people. He said there were two that were already dead when they got there, and they were put into body bags. And I don't know if the one that was still alive had put them into the bags or if someone assisted at the time. Um, there was one that was still alive and was walking around. At the sheriff's office, Sheriff Wilcox's wife later told her daughter what had really happened. She said that there was a, a flying saucer and that uh, they even found some bodies by it and one of them was alive and <clears throat> that uh, uh, the Army Air Force did not had come and threatened my father and his family to not mention anything at all about it. According to Frank Kaufman, the debris and bodies were flown to Air Force Intelligence Headquarters at Wright Field, and another consignment was sent to Andrews Air Force Base in Washington. How high did it go? All the way to the President, I was told. President Truman. The fact is, there is no proof, evidence, documentation, physical evidence of any sort to prove that your story is true. That's right. You have to accept it. I mean, you either believe it or you don't. I mean, see. There is no independent evidence to corroborate Frank Kaufman's story. Proving his involvement in clandestine operations, he claims, would be in breach of his military oath.
The lack of tangible evidence has been a consistent feature of the Roswell incident. Then earlier this year, a sensational film allegedly shot by an American military cameraman appeared in London. Our cameraman says that the crash happened in June. He was sent down to White Sands on the 2nd of June, 1947, and that um, they'd spent a week and a half clearing up the area. Um, he also explains that when they first arrived at the site, the, the, the area had been cordoned off and uh, you know, every, that no one uh, went anywhere near the vehicle. The, the, the ground surrounding the vehicle was hot. He said the creatures were all laying by the side, holding onto these oblong boxes which they wouldn't let go. And after a few hours, when the, when the military moved in, the, the instruction was to move away all the loose debris and the creatures. Ray Santilli claims he negotiated for two years to buy this film. He's the only person who knows the identity of the cameraman who shot it. According to Santilli, the poor quality is explained by the circumstances under which it was photographed. When he tells you that the camera had no zoom facility, when he tells you that he was wearing the same outfit as the surgeons, and you know, when he says that these cameras had, uh, had a fixed focus and that you know, when they moved in, that then there was no way of controlling the focus. And, you know, and it was poss it, it was, he was steaming up inside the costumes and he was trying to operate the camera to the best of his ability. You just have to accept it. But the other question is, well, why isn't it a fixed camera? Why isn't it a camera fixed above looking at the body? But then his argument is that, well, surgeons were bending over it all the time, and the only way you can get to see these things is by moving around. And the camera that, uh, that he detailed as using, we checked uh, at the museum, and, you know, it's a handheld camera. Despite repeated requests, Ray Santilli has been unable to arrange a meeting between us and the cameraman. So far, we have no real proof of his existence. The American Air Force categorically denied the existence of spacecraft and aliens, but mounting pressure from the public and a determined congressman forced the Pentagon to launch their own investigation. In July 1994, their official report admitted for the first time that the original weather balloon story was in fact a lie, designed to cover up what had really crashed at Roswell, a balloon of a different kind. This is film of Project Mogul, a top secret project designed to detect sound waves from Soviet atomic tests. The Air Force report states that Project Mogul offers the most likely explanation for the Roswell incident. I suspect that our Flight 4 on the 4th of June was probably the source of the debris that the rancher found. It was not recovered, uh, and the record indicates that the B-17 abandoned tracking it uh, while it was still airborne, and it's my memory uh, that it was over a little town called Arabella, uh, just north of Capitan and about 17 miles from where some debris was later found. Curiously, an examination of the actual flight logs of the time reveals that there is no record of the existence of flight number four on the 4th of June, the one the Air Force claims explains the Roswell incident. Moore says no records exist as no data was entered for unsuccessful flights, yet other flights that were unsuccessful are clearly documented. Discrepancies such as these have led many to doubt the Air Force's insistence that Project Mogul is in fact the answer to the Roswell mystery. On Capitol Hill, the representative for New Mexico, Congressman Stephen Schiff, is suspicious of the number of different explanations offered over the years. We've had three different explanations from the military about what crashed. The first explanation is it was a flying disc, meaning flying saucer in today's terminology. Uh, they changed that and said, we made a mistake. Uh, it wasn't uh, a flying disc, it was a weather balloon. I still find it amazing that the, that the United States top bomber wing, with the only wing that was eligible to carry nuclear weapons at that particular time, would not know a weather balloon from a flying saucer, but apparently somebody didn't, uh, according to them. So we then had the second explanation that this was a weather balloon, and we now have the third explanation that this was part of a highly classified radiation detection experiment. So we have three separate explanations as to what crashed, but no dispute that something crashed. 
If it wasn't a balloon, what did crash at Roswell? A flying saucer or something else? And how does the controversial alien film relate to the Roswell mystery? New Mexico is the most secret state in the Union. Historically, its deserts and skies have been the center for more highly classified and secret scientific projects than any other place on Earth. The suspicion is that some strange top secret military experiment could lie behind the Roswell mystery. Fifty years ago, the first atomic bomb was detonated in the Trinity test near White Sands. This summer, stealth warplanes were still on test flights in the skies above New Mexico. And almost half a century earlier, their predecessor, the Flying Wing, was also seen in these skies. In 1947, White Sands was the location where America developed its early missile technology with V-2 rockets captured from the Nazis. Nazi scientists had been secretly relocated at the end of the war to develop the first stage of America's space program. Werner von Braun, the inventor of the V-2, was in charge of the operation. It is known that animal experiments were part of the American space program in the 1950s. But could there have been any as early as 1947? One series, uh, which was known as Project Albert, which uh, launched a, a, a chimpanzee or a monkey, uh, a small monkey, uh, in one of the nose cones. Needless to say, the monkey didn't survive due to some technical difficulties with the nose cone in re-entering into the Earth's atmosphere. When was that? That was probably around the late, um, late 40s and the early 50s. And this was even before the famous ham, the space chimpanzee, which was trained uh, over at uh, the Alamogordo Air Force Base. Could it have been as early as 1947? Probably around 1947. I know that Project Albert began with, I believe, um, V2 number 47. Our investigation reveals for the first time that animal experiments may have been conducted much earlier than was previously thought. If so, then could the Roswell incident have been some highly secret experiment that went catastrophically wrong? Is it possible that a V-2 rocket with animals on board could have gone astray and may account for the descriptions of bodies and strange debris offered by so many witnesses at Roswell? Could the metal with the curious properties at the Foster Ranch have come from a crashed V2? We have researched our records extensively and on that specific date and time and even that month, uh, we had nothing that could conceivably uh, be within that area. We had been launching some balloons but nothing in that particular month when the crash at Roswell occurred and all of our uh, rockets that we did launch could be accounted for uh, during that time period and there was nothing that White Sands had available at that time that could reach that far over to Roswell. As far as White Sands is concerned, um, we're pretty clean on this incident. If the military authorities are to be believed, the records rule out the possibility of a crashed V2. But the military admitted lying before to cover up something more secret. It is this possibility which leads many to believe that the cover-up continues and according to Ray Santilli, the cameraman of the alleged alien autopsy seems to offer a tantalizing clue. They're not alien creatures as far as he's concerned. He just calls the creatures freaks all the time. He says they've got no reason to be here, and he says he doesn't know what they are. Our cameraman's a very religious guy. He just refuses to believe. And he was there at the time, he saw everything that happened, but he refuses to believe that these are extraterrestrials. He just says that, you know, it's just some goddamn experiment, and that's it. You know, he, he just calls them freaks. You have to remember, this is a cameraman that was there at White Sands, at the Trinity experiments as well. It appears that lots of weird and wonderful things happened at that time. As well as the autopsy, there is footage of strange debris, allegedly recovered at the site of a crashed space vehicle. Whatever the Santilli film represents, 
there is no question it demands serious investigation. These symbols bear some resemblance to actual letters. V-I-D-E-O, video. Despite doubts about its authenticity, we took the film to America to show to some of the witnesses that we originally interviewed about the Roswell incident. The uh, symbols are vaguely consistent with my memory, uh, since I can't be absolutely sure though, but they, they certainly could be consistent with what I saw. The differences would be the size and the fact that the ones I saw were not raised above the, uh, the uh, level of the beam. I'm trying to count the fingers in there. That's six. That's six. I don't recall six fingers, though. I don't know. It could, I, I won't swear to it, John. I don't recall those six fingers, though, to be honest with you. It doesn't look too close to the Roswell incident. I can say that much. Dr. Ian West is one of Britain's leading forensic pathologists. He's frequently called upon by Scotland Yard in murder investigations. The blood is, 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 is pattern is unusual. You don't normally get, you know, that incision has been open for some time now. We've got four little trails running from it. Although we have a number of quite distinct linear trails, dark trails, which look like blood trails, they're not of the nature that I would expect to see at a post-mortem. I would see some more smearing, some more irregularity in the blood loss from the, the margins of the incision. One has seen one distinctive organ removed from the upper central abdominal region. It's of the size of a liver, but it's not of the liver shape, and it's not in the liver position. I've seen no intestines that I can distinguish. Um, I can't distinguish the, the thoracic organs. It certainly doesn't resemble, from what one can see here, any human um, remains that I've ever seen. There's just no evidence to say this is definitely a... Nothing on the film which I, makes me say this is definitely a hoax. My feeling is that probably about 98% feeling is that this is probably a man-made hoax. I have, as I say, a 2% area where I don't know. Um, in my opinion, I think it's a special effect. It's uh, man-made. Uh, it's a good special effect. It's not going to be a cheap item. It's going to be, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars probably. It's difficult to say when something like that could have been made. Um, certainly that in the 60s they were doing things at Hammer, which were very similar. Um, I guess that it was not before the 60s, but sort of mid-60s I would think would be the earliest it could be. I don't think anyone could be certain that it's a special effect. I mean, it's uh, how do I know what the inside of aliens look like? No one knows. Um, I know what the inside of foam rubber and polyurethane foam looks like, and it looks very similar. Many people who are deeply suspicious about the film think that you could be behind the hoax yourself. What have you got to say to that? I'll still go back to what I said before. If, if someone, even if it was our company, wanted to hoax a piece of footage, why not do the job properly? Why not create something that really looks like an alien creature? You know, why, why come up with something where you've, where you've got these unnecessary hurdles of saying, well, is it human or is it not human? And in answer to your question, we didn't hoax it. Are you sure? Absolutely sure. 100% sure. I mean, you know. As of this moment, there is no conclusive evidence to prove that the film is either genuine or a hoax. Establishing its provenance is a critical factor in moving the Roswell mystery closer to resolution. One vital step would be to have the film chemically analysed by a photographic laboratory. Are you going to provide a proper a film extract which can be properly tested by Kodak, which has proper images on it. I'll provide you with a film. Uh, I'll provide you with what I can, which will be a film 
with image and um, the only way that I can do that is by securing some film from the collector that bought the first autopsy which uh, is currently en route to us. So far no suitable film extract has been provided for laboratory tests but we continue to press for it. Back in Washington, the search for tangible evidence of what happened at Roswell has continued on a different front. The issue is providing to the public uh, whatever records may still exist, if any, and there may not be any, but if any on the Roswell incident so people can make their own determination. That is the mission that I discussed with the General Accounting Office. The General Accounting Office is a powerful body which oversees government operations. They have been investigating government agencies to establish if there are any official records of the Roswell incident. In July this year, the GAO reported that the Air Force had destroyed their records relating to Roswell. For conspiracy theorists, it sounds all too convenient. But one man who would know if Roswell ever figured in secret files is Frederick Durant. In 1952, he investigated the whole question of flying saucers for the CIA. If there had happened in 47, we would have known about it in 52 or 53 when I was involved. And I truly believe that, it, that if that we had the best information available in the intelligence community, including the White House and the National Security Council. And the investigation would certainly <laughs> Have, have, in fact, it was not even considered in the Blue Book because it, it was meteorological balloon wreckage. But you are absolutely convinced that what you have told us what you saw and that that is 100% accurate? I am absolutely 100, 1,000%. It's the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth? That's right. As Ripley would say, believe it or not. For nearly 50 years, the Roswell incident has defied all attempts at rational explanation. In the world of UFO mysteries, it has become the most celebrated of them all. In the absence of any physical evidence, it all comes down to a question of faith. In the course of our investigation, we have encountered a wilderness of fact and fantasy credible witnesses relating credible tales with apparent sincerity. Incredible characters make outlandish claims that cast grave doubt on their own rationality. But could so many ordinary people from the rural heartland of America be either lying or afflicted by a false memory syndrome that leads to similar accounts of the same story? Basically, I think you'll find that the people who are telling you these stories are very ordinary uh, Americans. I know it happened. I know it was real. The threats were real. I think that they're covered up some, and I think they should tell the truth to the public now. Today, the Roswell incident remains shrouded in mystery. The Air Force insists that there are simply no secrets to conceal. Yet in a final twist, a source close to the Pentagon has informed us that secret documents have now come to light. And that in the next few months, a new report will finally explain the mysterious accounts of strange bodies. It is just possible that the riddle of the Roswell incident may yet turn out to be a cosmic Watergate. General Ramey describes the object as being of flimsy construction, almost like a box type. He says that it was so battered that he was unable to determine whether it had a disc form, and he does not indicate its size. Ramey says that so far as can be determined, no one saw the object in the air, and he describes it as being made of some sort of tin form. Other army officials say that further information indicates the object.